I was, I was going to say, can you help me welcome to the stage Mike Todd and Chad Veach, but you already did. Hey, we, um, we have a little bit of a different session. Good to see you, fellas. Happy that you're here. Man, glad to be here. Are you enjoying yourself? This is VU Conference 2019. What do you mean, bro? Chad, how you feeling? I feel like the Mexican cousin. I'm glad to be here. You know, uh, Chad's been coming to conference for a long time, and Mike has actually been preaching at VU quite a bit this past year. But this is, this is your first time actually at VU conference. Both of you guys are coming back for 2020, which is pretty awesome. Um, how do you like it so far? Man, there is something electric in this building. When people come with expectation and they actually invested to be somewhere, it's one of the most amazing things because God never, ever fails to show up when we make a meeting with him. It's many times when, when he makes a meeting with us, we don't show up. But I think there's about 5,000 people in the building that expected God to show up. And he's not going to disappoint. Let's go. Well, today we're going to attempt to do something that we've never done before at VU Conference. I'm excited about it. Uh, if you've got a Bible, I want you to turn with us really quick to Matthew chapter 26. We have attempted to write, prepare, talk about, pray about a sermon together. And uh, in this session, we want to preach from the three of us really to, to VU Conference. And I believe this is a word the Lord has given us. But uh, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 26. And Chad, why don't we go ahead? You want to read verses 36 through maybe 41 or so. Let's go to 41. Matthew 26, verse 36. If you're with me, say yeah. yeah. All right. It says, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, my father, if it is possible, make this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you man keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I want you uh, to write down the title of the message that we're going to preach together today. Write down this title. It's called Scared But Prepared. Hashtag bars. Hashtag scared but prepared. Let's pray and let's believe the Holy Spirit's going to speak to us. Lord, we thank you so much for VU Conference 2019. God, we thank you for your word, which is a firm foundation. Today, we stand upon your word. Today, Lord, we pray that as we read this word, this word would read us, that we would leave this session better than how we walked in here. We give you praise. We give you glory in Jesus' mighty and matchless name. Everybody, if you believe it, everybody said. Amen. Oh, come on, Vu Conference, one more time. Make some noise in this house. So we want to talk to you today from the standpoint of leadership. And I think sometimes at VU Conference, if we're not careful, we can kind of just categorize because there's so many church planners and church leaders. We can just talk church leadership. But the truth of the matter is, if you're in this room right now, we believe that each and every one of you are called to leadership. Leadership is simply influence. So wherever you find yourself in life, you are called to make a difference in that place. And you're called to influence. Yet one of the things I think that people fail to realize when they step out into leadership is that leadership is scary. Like all the time. It's like, it's really, really scary. And right here in Matthew chapter 26, we see this moment where Jesus is about to go and fulfill his greatest mission on the earth, which is to die on the cross. And as he does, he's in this garden and he's praying to the Father. And as he's praying, he's actually expressing that he's scared. He's saying, Father, if it's at all possible, let this cup pass from me. But I love what he says. He says, but not my will, your will. See, every leader that's called by God is not called to live according to your will, but according to his will. And what he says, though, at the end is he says, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. I think in life, what's going to take place, whether you're exactly where you want to be today in leadership, you're in this place right now where the future can be scary. 
But maybe there's a lot of us in this room that you're not in the place that you want to be and you're going, am I ever going to get out of this rut? That's scary. And sometimes we can't actually define or we can't actually change the thing that we're afraid of. But what we can do in that season is we can be making sure that we are getting prepared. I think leadership is about being scared, but I'm going to get prepared. And I just thought for a moment as we're kind of kicking off into this, this message, both of you guys are leading at such a high level, such a high capacity. Really, you're all over the world preaching the gospel. You guys are both involved in other spaces outside the church. I'm just curious if we can get kind of real for a moment. Maybe just talk about a couple moments that you have been scared in leadership. That's what I'm really, really after. You got any like good moments of just being afraid, Chad? Yeah, I'll never forget the first time I, was, I became a youth pastor when I was 19. And so this local high school invited me to come uh, MC the high school talent show. And so I was excited. It's a, you know, I want to get into the school and be used on this campus. So I got there. And what I didn't know was that the talent show was all in Spanish. So every act was in Spanish. I was the only thing in English. I've never been more scared. Like I tried to use my six Spanish words. I'm like, ustedes, como estas? Bienvenidos, welcome, Ricardo. Like that's, I was so scared the whole time. But it's just, I feel like so much of being used by God in leadership is just being okay with being scared, not knowing all the answers and not you know, knowing everything to do. So I, think, I think it's good that sometimes we live with that tension of like, I'm not an expert right now. I'm learning as I go. And God will give me the wisdom. He'll give me the, the, the favor and the relationships and the strength to, to walk in spaces that seem scary. I could play oceans right now. I think one of the coolest things about walking with God, it is a walk of dependence. So if you're not, if you're completely dependent on yourself at any moment, you may be doing it by yourself. Like God may not be with you. And so I think he always calls us to be at this place of vulnerability where we do not have everything together. And so I think about tons of times, like in my story, like I have no formal education in ministry. Uh, I've... I've never spoken a message um, in front of people until seven years ago. I've, I've never done anything like that before. So every day I get up, I'm scared. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm, <si> <laughs> I'm, I'm dead serious because I know who I am without God. And, and, right. and it's almost that thing that keeps me completely dependent. And I almost like it because if I really was comfortable in all my skill, I would get up and do things thinking that it was me. But every time that I get up before people, the way that I love my wife, the way that I'm a father to my kids, I'm a leader and I don't know what I'm doing. And so what that does is it says, Father, I need you to be the strength in the middle of my weakness. Everything that I'm not, you are. You called me with my flaws and all. Thank you, Beyonce. I, and, and so I, I think there's, there's, it's a daily thing for me to get up and acknowledge that I don't have what it takes to do this, but God, you do. And so me and you together is the majority. I, I think... For me on the journey, like one of the things as, I, as we've stepped out in faith, like so often I think what we think is going to happen is that everything's going to get easier. Yeah. But what you learn is it doesn't get easier. You just get stronger. Yes, yes. I remember when we first launched Voo Church, like I thought like day one, it was like, yay, hip hop hooray, like everyone shows up. And then day two, like the attacks began. Yeah. Yeah. I think over and over again, what I'm trying to tell my spirit on the journey of leadership is I'm thinking about stories like this of Jesus in the garden. Yeah. Where here he is, and this is where we actually see that Christ, yes, he's all God, but he's also all man. It's a beautiful, beautiful theological picture that we have here that we discovered that this is, this is the son of man that Daniel prophesied about. This is Jesus. And here he is in the garden, and he's sweating drops of blood because what's in front of him, he is afraid of. And I think the quicker that we can actually just get open about that, get vulnerable about that, talk about that. You know, both of you guys uh, happen to be two guys that I text quite a bit. And I find myself texting you after some of the tough days. <laughs> I find myself texting you after it went really, really bad. But what I've learned is that as soon as I just get open about what I'm afraid of and I allow somebody else to speak into it, how quickly courage comes into my situation. 
for you guys, when it comes to this idea of fear, is there any moment that you can think of that you were going, you know what, man, on this journey, like, I don't know if I've got what it takes right here in this moment. Again, every day. <laughs> no. I think of a specific moment is when I became the lead pastor of um, Transformation Church. It was a church that had been going, oh, I love y'all, Transformation Nation, what up? Um, okay, so it had been going for 15 years. And I took it over after it had a 15 year run. So everybody that was there knew what it was for 15 years. And then I'm supposed to come in and not change anything, keep everything the same and keep it running. And the first day God told me, he said, I want to change the fabric of this church and you're going to honor the whole way. So what does that mean? He said, I want you to stand up and I want you to declare what is not here now in front of everybody. That's, that's how dumb. <laughs> Could I just write that in a journal? And then when it happens, then, you know what I'm saying? But he said, no, the first thing I did, I stood up, I said, um, God told me that this is gonna be, <laughs> in my voice, I, don't know, I went back to puberty again. Yeah, God, God told me that this church would be multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-campus, and multiplying. <laughs> and that's what the audience did, they laughed at me. And, um, but it was at that moment that God said, I needed you to be a leader and step towards the obstacle, not away from it. And when I look at the life of David, that was the thing that separated him from the entire children of Israel, is that when Goliath, their obstacle, was shouting at them, the entire trained army took a step back. When David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That was cuss words back then. Like that was, who is this big? Trash talk. Like, <laughs> yeah. And he said, I'm going to step towards it. And I think that was a moment where in the midst of my fear, I had to go ahead and declare and say something that was contrary to everything that I was seeing. Yeah. And God told me in that moment, he said, you just made the step that will allow the giant to fall. And I'm just encouraging some people in here that, that though you're scared with your knees shaking and your voice trembling and you not even sure if it can happen, you need to stand and declare what God has placed on your heart and your act of faith will be the reasons why giants fall. Amazing. I think the most unprepared I've ever felt was um, we launched our church, I think three weeks before you guys. And we launched our church in, in LA, in, in West Hollywood. And um, we started in the club. Yeah. You know? Meet me at the church. <laughs> it's going down. It's going down. Me, no, okay, let me. <laughs> started from the club. This now could be here. very dangerous, the two of you on this stage together. Ah! We could rap right now. We can go, uh, that guy. Um, but we started in a club. And um, it was amazing. You, you were there and, and, you know, we had, we were on Sunset Boulevard at One Oak, which at the time in LA was like the number one club. And um, I love clubs, you know, like that guy. <laughs> but um, why'd you start in a club? I love them. They just, anyways. So we started in this club and um, the night was unbelievable. Like the security said this, this is, this is not my words, but the security told our team, we've never seen more people here. This is like the hottest club in LA. And um, they had to turn people away and there was lines down Sunset Boulevard and it was this epic night. And it was to, to, for my wife and I, it was like the best night we've ever, like this is unbelievable for, as a ministry standpoint. And so I remember telling the whole crowd that was there that night, I'll see you back next Sunday, 11 a.m., 6 p.m. right here. This thing's official. We, we, we launched a church. And the next morning, we got an email from the owner said, you could never have church here ever again. You had too big of a crowd and your crowd is a liability. I'm like, my crowd is sober. How could it be liability? <laughs> like we're on coffee and like club soda. Like this is not bad. But, I, but I'll never forget that whole week. We just like, we were in a panic trying to find a venue. We didn't find a venue till Friday. So here we go, launch this church. And we tell everybody, we'll see you back next week. We didn't have a place to meet until Friday. And we ended up at the El Rey Theater where we meet still today. But it was this moment where I'm like, I'm not ready for this. Like I'm used to being a youth pastor with a $10 budget annually. And I can do that. 
Like, I can do that. All the youth pastors said, amen. amen. I wasn't prepared for that. It's amazing because you don't really know what you're prepared for until you step into That's it. Good. I'm telling you over and over again, leadership is this feeling. I'm scared, but I'm trusting that I'm prepared. I'm scared, but I'm trusting that I'm prepared. And Jesus, he says something here in this text that's really kind of amazing to me because here he is going, Father, not my will, but your will. Let this cup pass from me. I don't really want to do this. I don't really feel like doing this. This is scary. This is a big deal going to the cross. But here he goes. This is what he says. He says, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. And I think today what we want to try to attempt to answer a little bit is, what does it look like to prepare a ready spirit? What does it look like to have a spirit that is prepared and available for when God says it's time to step out and go, that although you are afraid, you will remind yourself of God's word, that it's not by might nor by power, but by the spirit of God. Can I get a witness in this afternoon session if you know what I'm talking about? You might be scared, but I got a feeling God wants to prepare you. This is a season right now that I don't know what it is that you are waiting for God to do, but what I know about leaders is that we're always waiting for the next. But I want you to write this down today. You should be living like God is doing what you're waiting for. That's good. So whatever, whatever it is that you're waiting for right now, like your actions shouldn't change in that next season. You should already be living and behaving like that thing is occurring. So if we're going to get our spirit prepared, if we're going to get ourselves to a place that we're available to God, I think the first thought that we have to consider is this word patience. Everyone say patience. patience. Like that's not a fun word to talk about, <laughs> but that's actually, I think, what God's calling our generation to understand. That if you want to be a person who's preparing right now for what he has next for you, it's going to require patience. And here's the truth. Patience does not mean waiting. Because like one way or another, you're going to wait. Patience is the attitude that you maintain while you wait. So can you actually be patient? Can you take on the right attitude while you wait for God to do the thing that you're believing for? And here's the annoying thing about patience, right? Because some of you, you're about to pray one of the boldest prayers you've ever prayed. In a moment, as we get ready to close this session, you're going to say, God, make me patient. And guess what? He's going to answer that request. It's called traffic on Monday. It's called slow internet on Tuesday. <laughs> because the only way God can make you patient is he has to put a trial or a test in front of you that will make you wait. And he wants to see the attitude that you take on while you wait. See, if you're really going to live the dream and if you're really going to sell out and say, I'm in with you, Jesus, I'm telling you, you can trust God that his timing is better than your timing. I'm telling you, the only thing worse than not waiting on God is wishing that you had. <laughs> We want to be a generation that we actually trust God and his timing. You know, we didn't just start a church out of nowhere. Um, it's funny how like Instagram and how things can just pop up and it can be kind of confusing. A lot of people will come to me like, yo, man, it seems like Voo Church just grew so quick. And we've had some incredible growth. But you need to understand that Voo Church, in September, it'll be a four-year official story. But it's not really a four-year official story. Like there's a whole lot to the story. And if you really want to go back to the beginning of Voo Church, it started when I was 17 years of age in Adelaide, Australia, sitting on the second row of a conference like this. I can't remember who was preaching. I can't remember what the session was about. All I remember is answering the call of God, saying, God, whatever you ask of me, I will go. And it was in that session that I started getting visions and I started getting ideas and I started believing that God had a big future for me. I started seeing myself doing things that I wasn't presently doing at that moment. We're talking about like 18 years ago. And many of the things that God showed me when I was 17 are just now coming to pass. But can I just be honest with you? When God started giving me opportunities and God started using me, I, I, I never wanted to ever, ever take advantage or I never wanted to get familiar with the opportunities. I remember when I was in Bible college, we started this like little prayer meeting and about 30 people ended up showing up to this prayer meeting. I thought that was like revival at my Christian college, you know? <laughs> I'd be preaching, I'd be shouting, I'd like get in, there's like 30 people. I'd be like, let's go, you know? 
And I remember that summer I'd started this little group and it was called Broken. That was, we had a worship team and I was the preacher. How cool is that name, Broken? God only works with broken stuff. And my dad purchased us a minivan and a trailer and he booked us all up and down the East Coast preaching at different little youth ministries. I remember one time in particular, I've told the story before, but I, I showed up in the state of Georgia to a youth meeting. There was five people in the youth meeting. I still used a microphone. Come on, let's go. Why? Because I didn't see five people. I believe that one day, if we would just stay faithful, God could give us arenas full of people, and I wanted to practice and live like God was already doing what I was waiting for. See, the challenge with God is that when God knocks on your door and opportunity knocks, you can't say, yo, come back later. And some of us, we don't even understand it, but like opportunity is already knocking, but you're complaining about the noise. You thought your opportunity was going to be easy. No, 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 no. God opportunities are presented to you full of obstacles, full of challenges. Today, how did we get here? It's taken us 10 years to even get into a space like this. 10 years of just grinding and being faithful and saying, God, we're going to be patient. We're going to trust, Lord, that when you actually knock on the door, we're going to be ready to go. I remember uh, a couple months ago, some of our friends, uh, I was getting ready to go preach at a, at a church, and some of my friends were coming to pick me up that morning, but the call time was like 5.45 a.m. How many know that Jesus is not even awake at 5.45 a.m.? And, and literally, I'll never forget it because, like, somehow my, my buddies, they were able to, like, break into the house and, like, they're knocking on my bedroom door like, Rich, you got to wake up. And I wake up kind of like, what, what do we mean? And they're like, they're like, you have to fly today. I was like, oh, my, my bags aren't packed. Like, I wasn't ready. And I just wonder how many of us in this place were so dreaming about the future, were so excited about the next season but we're missing our opportunity to patiently pursue the things of God and let him prepare in us the things that he has for us so the day that he does knock on our door, the bags are packed, we're ready to go. I've already seen myself doing this. I'm being patient waiting on God. Yes, I am scared, but I am not wasting one moment not getting prepared. And if you're gonna prepare your spirit, because there's gonna come these moments where truly, you're going to be saying, let this cup pass for me. This is too scary for me. I'm scared, but Lord, I've got a willing spirit because I've been preparing myself. It's going to require patience, I believe, Chad, but what else? I, I, think, I think it's going to require patience, but I think the second P to it is perseverance because you're going to, you're going to have moments. You're going to have moments when you, you do feel like quitting. I think, I think the great part about the Garden of Gethsemane is Jesus has never been more relatable than he is in this moment. Like Jesus wants to quit. He wants to throw in the towel. Have you ever been there before? Yeah. Jesus is like, nope, I do not want to do this. This does not sound fun. Let's stop here and stop now. It's amazing that he is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane literally translated is oil press. I don't know if you've ever been anointed by oil, but in scripture, oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So if you ever come to a prayer meeting and we anoint you with oil, it's because we're anointing you with the Holy Spirit. But if you want oil, you got to go through some crushing. You got to crush something to bring out the oil. The anointed one is in the garden of oil press because he's about to get anointed at another level. I wonder how many of us have quit right before a greater authority, a greater anointing, and a greater breakthrough was just about to happen, but we said, no, nah, I got to get out of here. This is too much. And so if you've ever felt like quitting, good news. So did Jesus. So you're not bad if you felt like quitting. You're not an awful leader if you, Jesus himself felt like quitting. It's just the fact that he didn't quit. He just kept on going. He kept going to the next level for the joy that was set before him. I have felt like quitting before. The first time I felt like quitting was when we lost the club, One Oak. The second time I felt like quitting was our first conference. So we have a conference in Los Angeles and when we got ready to do our first conference, we host ours in the summertime in LA. 
and we got ready to go. And right as we were getting ready to launch our first conference ever, my wife texted me and said, you're never gonna believe what has happened to our kids. Now we already have, our oldest is special needs. So I'm thinking what else could have happened? You ever get a text when you know it's something's really wrong? Like I knew it was really wrong. So she sends me a photo of our boys. Go ahead and put up on the screen. This is a photo of my Mavi right here. He has broken out in the craziest reaction to God knows what. I think it's attack of Satan. Somebody say amen. My wife is freaking out and she's like, are you kidding me? We're having our first conference and look what's happened to our kids. And throughout our conference, our kids had this outbreak. All of our kids had this outbreak all over their skin. And we saw it as an attack on our home. We saw it as an attack that I was trying to bring a miracle to our city, trying to have another level of breakthrough. And anytime you get ready to step out, there's always going to be some resistance. Just a heads up, if you feel like you're under attack, it's probably a sign that you're going in the right direction, doing the right thing. It's probably a sign that maybe God's trying to use you at another level and Satan's not just going to roll over to that. So we got through it and our kids got healed. And we were fine. And we go to the next conference last summer, our second conference, and we get ready to go. And the week of our second conference, I got another text from my wife again. And she says, this time it is our oldest, my daughter, Georgia. And I just had to call 911 to have the ambulance come pick her up. She can't stop having seizures. So I'm, this is a Sunday morning and I'm preaching and Julia goes to the hospital in the ambulance with my daughter. Let me show you a photo of my daughter, Georgia. This is my daughter, Georgia, right before our second conference. And I gotta be honest, I can deal with the club and I can deal with some skin reaction, but this for me was the time that I was like, God, I don't want my kids to suffer. God, I don't wanna keep leading if it's gonna affect my family. This was the first time for me in 19, 20 years of ministry that I was like, I don't know if I want to keep going. Have you ever been there before? Have you ever been in the spot where you're like, I don't know, what is this going to cost me? And I had to make a decision in the point of quitting, am I going to roll, roll over and give in to this attack or am I going to keep going? I love Jesus. He's feeling pressed. He's in the garden. He's like, I don't want to do this. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. I'm just here to tell you today, if you keep on going, there's a breakthrough on another side. Come on, if you keep on pressing, there's another anointing on the other side. Come on, is there anybody at VU Conference 2019 that's willing to keep running your race and seeing what God has in store? Just love the Bible. Because it says, don't grow weary in doing good, for in due season, you're going to see a harvest. So many of us were just like, I feel bad. I feel rejected. I feel alone. I feel like things are against me. We don't go off our feelings. We go off faith. <laughs> feelings come and feelings go. If you're a leader and you are driven and led by your emotions, you are not gonna last a long time. We don't go off feelings, we go off facts. And the facts are, God is good, God is awesome, He is seated on the throne, He is for us, who can be against us? Come on, is there anybody here that believes that if God be for me, who can be against me? Come on, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength and the stronghold of my life. I'm not going to be afraid of some attack. You got to keep going. You got to keep pressing. Yes, sir. If you don't quit, you're going to win. But you can't win if you keep quitting. Quitting is easy. Anybody could quit. Church is a collection of looking at somebody at church and going, hey, what happened to so-and-so? You, uh, you seen songs up? <laughs> nah, man, you know. I do, I, clearly, I don't. <laughs> if you don't quit, you win. The only way you can win is if you don't quit. We don't go by our feelings, we go by faith. 
Maybe you could lose position, status. Just because you made a mistake doesn't mean you are a mistake. You're not defined by what you've done. You are defined by what he's done. And I love the Bible because it says, though a righteous man falls seven times, he still rises. Just a heads up, you are going to make mistakes. Welcome to the club. But the only winners are the ones that don't quit. Don't quit on your marriage. Don't quit on your business. Please don't quit on your church. Don't quit on your calling. Don't quit on your children. Don't quit on your future. God has a plan. And the only way you're going to tap into it is if you don't quit. Jesus in the garden, he's like, oh, I don't want to do this. He's vulnerable. He's, he's authentic. He's honest. I'm okay with you wanting to quit. I'm not okay with you executing the quit. You can want to do it. You just, I feel like quitting every Monday. All the pastors said, amen. But you got to keep going. I'll never forget the, the, the first time my wife ran the New York City Marathon. My wife, shout out to my wife, she ran the New York City Marathon, 26 miles. And my wife, I'll never forget, she's like, babe, I want to run the New York City Marathon. I was like, all right, cool. You mean you, not we, right? She's like, yeah, yeah, for sure. I was like, let's go. So we flew over to New York. We got her all signed up. And we made a plan that we were going to meet up throughout the marathon, meet up at different mile markers. So I'll never forget the day that my wife ran the New York City Marathon. On every, every time we met up, she had a different emotion. <laughs> First time we met up, mile seven, she's like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. This is so great. I feel so good. Next time we met up, mile 14, she's like, I hate you. You're lazy. Why aren't you out here? Why am I by myself? You're going to pay for this when we get home. That's great. Oh, shoot. Great. But I will never forget when my wife finished the New York City Marathon. You end in Central Park, thousands of runners. She went through the finish line, and I'm trying to find her. She's trying to find me, and they put this blanket bib over everyone that finishes, so everybody looks the same. So she's on her phone, and I'm on my phone, and we're trying to line up streets so I can finally, you know, meet up with her. And, and, and finally, I see her in a distance on the phone, and I hang up. I start running towards her. I'm just, I, she didn't run towards me. She was done running for the day. She's done. That's enough. You will come to me. So I got to her and I, I picked her up and I'm, I'm hugging her and I'm crying. And she, I almost said, we did it. <laughs> but I, I didn't say that. I didn't, I didn't, I promise I didn't say that. But I'm crying, I'm holding her. I'm like, you did it. I'm just telling you right now, I want to hear those words when I finish my life. Well done, thy good and thy faithful servant. You fought the good fight. You finished the race. Come on, somebody make some noise today. If you're willing to persevere and endure, don't you quit. There's a greater call. There's a greater future. Come on, give God praise. I'm not going by my feelings. I'm living according to my faith. If you don't quit, you win. So it does take patience and it does take perseverance. And Mike, what else does it take? I think it takes having the right pace. Now, they only gave me about 15 minutes. But when I think about the journey of Jesus, he went at a pace that was not popular. And in Western culture right now, the pace that everybody's supposed to be on is hustle, grind. Make it happen. Wake up and eat. It's like, it, it, it's, it's like this whole thing is, I'm going to do it because I don't trust God will. 
So I got a network when I come to VU conference and I'm not listening to the message, but I'm trying to find out who I need to position myself next to because maybe if I get close enough to the right people, I can get in the room that will allow them to hear that I have a gift and a calling on my life. And maybe if they hear if I have a gift and a calling on my life, maybe I'll get on a platform that one day the person that really needs to see me will see me and God says, you did all of that. And Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I have a plan for you, a plan to prosper you and not harm you, a plan to give you a hope and a future. And, and I, I found this being one of the biggest dilemmas of my life. It's that I had bought into Western culture's idea of success and not God's plan for my life. And so when it came to finding out a pace, I only knew one pace, pedal to the metal. Everything that I could do, I was going to make it happen for myself. If you give me an inch, I'm going to rip a door down. If you give me somebody's number, I'm going to call until they recognize who I am. And this whole thing has allowed a generation to raise up of people who will position themselves before they allow God to position them. And I know this is not popular, but either we believe the word or we don't, that promotion actually comes from the Lord. And so when I look at Jesus, though, Rich, he's in the worst moment of his life. The only way he got to the worst moment that would become the best moment for all of us when he takes the cross and he pays the final payment is that he had to go at a pace that he was graced for. And what I had to come to the conclusion of is that, Michael, you can no longer go at the pace of your skill, the pace of your personality. You have to go at the pace of grace. See, a lot of people are striving to get to a place that God said, if you would just allow me to do it and do your part in the meantime, I'll take you to places nobody could ever fathom you would be. I'll use you in ways that nobody thought you could ever be used. And I know some of y'all sitting here like, that's good for you to say, Pastor Mike, you're on the platform right now in a light purple jacket, the same color as Rich's pants and the stage is glowing. But what you don't know is that 24 months ago, I sat in conferences like this all over the world. In that section up there. All the people in the balcony make some noise. Everybody in the balcony. The first shall be last. No. I used to sit in places like that. And I didn't know nobody. I sat in conferences that Chad was at, that Rich was at, that Carl was at, that Judah was at, that Don Cherie was at. I, I, I sat and I, I, I jumped when Social Club was, was, was going ham. Oh, you can't say that in church, huh? Okay. You see, I'm not finished yet. I, I'm not done, but I, I'm willing. I'm willing to go at a pace where I didn't elevate myself, but God elevated me. And I remember having to make a decision because Jesus had to make decisions to not do what everybody wanted him to do because he could, but go at the pace that God called him to go at. Do you remember he was 12 years old and he was feeling himself? And there was something in him like, yo, I'm the son of God on earth. And I'm 12 and I'm about to hit puberty and this is about to be amazing. And he goes to the synagogues and he's schooling everybody at 12. Saying like, yo, this is what this means and this is what, no, 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 y'all got that wrong. <laughs> I know what this means. And he's doing this, but he forgot one thing. He didn't tell his mama Mary. And I have to imagine Mary was a black mother. <laughs> because she was cleaning up the house. And I don't know, this may be my only experience because my mama's a black mother. And she was like, Jesus, where that boy at? <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> Jesus! And she starts looking for him and she finds him 
There he is. And she probably had a superpower like my mama had. She could say a full sentence without even breaking her teeth. She said, Jesus. And he was like, Ma, what are you talking about? Hold on, y'all. Give me one second. <laughs> Mary. She said, what did you call me? Hey, you got to realize that I was just in here doing my father's business <laughs> and I was out here. And watch what happens. We do not hear from Jesus for another 18 years. No, you missed it. We don't hear from him ever again until he's 30. Now, now I want you to think, now, now, okay, it's funny, but think about it. I think that God allowed that to happen to slow Jesus' pace down. Because there were some things he needed to develop in the dark room that could not be shown and seen in front of everybody. Now, I know a lot of people don't know anything about this, but before your, your, your cameras had smartphones and, and before you had pictures that, that had great pixels, there had these things called instant cameras. That, that you would take a picture, there was 24 of them, and then you had to do this little click, 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 click thing. And then you would take another picture, and then I know a lot of y'all don't know anything about this, but you had to take the film out of the camera and drop it off with the professional. And you had to leave it there for some time. Because that film had to be, say this cuss word with me, processed. And until we embrace the process and allow God to develop our negatives in a dark room, we become overexposed and the vision or the picture of what God wanted to be seen will never ever be able to be seen. And that's why I'm encouraging you right now, no matter if you feel like you're behind or if you're too late, God says you're right in the pace of grace. I have a place for you that's not going to be rushed. That's not going to be something that'll be what everybody else does. But it's going to be the pace I've graced you for. So Jesus, for 18 years, is not seen by anybody, even though he probably could perform miracles. Even though he probably could write a song that would be sung on the platform. Even though you probably could start a YouTube channel that the world would watch. God says, not yet. He says, because if you get out of my pace, anything you make up outside of me, you have to sustain outside of me. How does this practically work in my life? I ain't know none of these guys. And the Holy Spirit told me when I took over Transformation Church four years ago, four and a half years ago, he said, your days of neck working are officially over. I said, what do you mean? He says, I don't want you to meet anybody or try to position anything in your life. He said, I'll bring everybody into your life when you need them, and I will make everybody exit your life when you need them. <laughs> ah, that sounds great. That's hard. It culminated in this moment where my friend Paul Doherty, um, he, he has a church in Tulsa called Victory, and he invited um, Stephen Furtick to come preach at his church. And... Um, for me, when I was in my dark room, Pastor Steve and Judah and Chad and T.D. Jakes, all of, I would just, I would listen to all of these people and I was just trying to just have faith, to be patient, to persevere and to find my pace. And so I wanted to thank Pastor Stephen. I was like, yo, Paul, hey bro, I know I'm nobody, but I'm coming to this conference, bro. Can you hook me up? He's like, bro, don't even worry about it. I'm going to sit you right in the front with Steven. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> I walked into the building, and as I walked in, the Holy Spirit said, don't you meet Stephen Furtick tonight. <laughs> I rebuke you, Satan. Like, what? <laughs> and I heard it again. This is not the night you're supposed to meet him. I walk into the building because it was about, about 5,000 people, and it was like, yeah, 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 
I don't got to meet Stephen Furtick. There's 5,000 people. They're probably going to sit me way away from him. Don't even worry about it. They sit me right behind him. And then Paul says, why don't you turn around and greet your neighbor? And this was the moment I got to decide, would I obey God and follow the pace that he was setting in this situation? Or would I try to make a way for myself? And so I turned around and I met a woman named Susan. <laughs> when I met Susan, all I was thinking was, yo, I just wanted to tell him, in my mind, it was just an innocent. I just thought it would be a cool. And God said, you don't see the future. But I do. I walked out and the Holy Spirit said, thank you for obeying the pace that I set for you. Two months later, I get a call while I'm studying from a young lady who works at Elevation Church. She was like, I thought we connected at the conference that we were in, but I just need to get your information because Pastor Stevens trying to get in contact with you. I said, they must have some other Stevens at that church. Because <laughs> I know it can't be Pastor Stephen Ferdinand. Five minutes later, I get a minute and 41 second voice note that's still on my phone today. And it's Pastor Stephen. He said, hey, man, I don't know who you are. He said, but I was looking for my message um, that I taught on capacity, and yours was the next one because I had stole his message, and I had preached it at my church. <laughs> oh, y'all want to be real in the building, huh? Sure. See, you got to realize when you're scared on, yeah. how you're preparing, yeah. sometimes you got to lean on other people and and, 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 and take things and put your own DNA on it. And so I wasn't out here trying to impress nobody. I was just trying to make it through the Sunday with the 400 people at my church that God called me to lead. So I boosted his sermon. <laughs> and gave him credit for it in the beginning of the message. I said, this message impacted me so much that I had to just give it to y'all. But who would have known that that message I preached a year earlier, he would be on YouTube looking for that message and the next one would be mine and something in him stopped in his busy schedule and watched the entire thing. And he said, I don't know who you are, man, but I just wanted to find you and tell you that you're called, that you're anointed, that God's hand is on your life. And, and, he, and he went on for a minute and 41 seconds. I was nobody to him, but I was somebody to God. And, uh, and until you believe that God's plan for your life is better than your plan for your life, you will do things outside of the pace of God. The only reason I stand on this stage today is because I followed the pace that God set for me. And there are things that he's still shown me that I know may be years away. But I've made a decision that the right thing at the wrong time is a curse. No, 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 no. Some of y'all praying, oh my God, I just want my husband. I just want him to be 6'6 six, six and saved. I just want him to put it down, but then like praise God too. <laughs> and all I'm telling you is you might want to spend this time preparing who God's created you to be. Because the right thing at the wrong time is a curse. Well, Pastor Rich, if he would just see what's in me, he would make me one of the speaking pastors at VU Church. He's blinded him on purpose. Because there's things that if it was put on this platform, the character that's inside of you would actually come out and God's giving you an opportunity to have a character that can be able to sustain what he's called you to. But without those three things, Without being patient, without persevering when it gets hard, and without following the pace that God sets, you'll never fully be able to embrace your purpose. And this is one of the thoughts I want to end with, if it's okay. 
Jesus never reached his potential. Now, I know this is messed with a lot of people's theology. Because since I've been young, everybody's like, Mike, you need to reach your potential. Everything that God said and, and put in, inside of you, it needs to happen. But when I study the scriptures, he never reached his potential. When he died up on the cross, he said three words. He said, it is finished. What was finished? Not his potential, because he had the potential to overthrow Caesar. He had the potential to be a Roman guard. He had the potential to do all kinds of stuff. The thing that was finished was his purpose. And if you do, uh, if you don't follow the pace of God, if you don't have perseverance in hard times, if you don't get patient, you spend your life trying to fulfill your potential and you'll die never reaching your purpose. The only way we get well done, good and faithful servant, is not if we did everything we could do. It's if we did the thing that God called us to do. So today, at the afternoon session of Food Conference, I want to know if there's about 5,000 people that'll say, you know what, I might be scared of what's in front of me, but I'm not going to waste this time. I'm going to prepare. If you're in this room, I feel the presence of God in here. Because <laughs> there's, there's things that are going to awaken in you to allow you to know that you didn't miss your moment. Like, like, I think that's the, that FOMO thing is real. Like the fear of missing out. And, and when you're in Christ, I really do believe that he works all things together. And so today, if there's been any area of your life where you have not been preparing, I just want to make it that broad. Like, if you know you've not been doing what you were supposed to do, I ain't going to call you up here and ask you, tell us all the books you didn't read. Like, I'm not going to do that to you. But if there's some areas of your life, I don't care if you're a senior pastor, if you're a CEO, I don't care if you're a classroom teacher, if you're an artist, I don't care where. But if you know there's some areas that you have not been preparing because there's been a seed of fear in you, like, I don't know if I can, or I don't know if anybody will support me, or I don't know how it's going to happen. But you're saying, you know what, Pastor Mike, Pastor Rich, Pastor Chad, I'm not going to wait for it to happen. <laughs> I'm going to use this moment. Do y'all know there is no wasted wait? Your wait will never be wasted. If you're in this room and you need to make a fresh commitment to God to prepare in this season for whatever, the next season holds. I want you to just lift your hand up in the air. I don't care who you are. There's people all over this building right now. And this is what I'm going to ask you to do. I feel the presence of God. I'm going to ask you in this moment right now, I want you to tell God, not me, not your neighbor. I want you to tell God and give him a fresh commitment of your life. And I'm going to ask the worship team to just lift it up for a second because I feel like a lot of times in these conferences, we try to make it about this unified moment that we make happen. But a lot of times when we change is in the moment where we make a commitment to God for ourselves. And, and so we're going to ask them to worship just a little bit, but I don't want you to look at me. I don't want you because I got to make my own fresh commitment today. Like this ain't for y'all. This is for me. And I want you to tell God where, where you've been scared but now where you're going to start preparing. Like, I want you out loud. Everybody say out loud. You just did it right there. I want you to say it out loud. Father, I've been afraid to actually ask for help because it would, it would make me look deficient in this area. But today I'm laying down my pride where, where people would think about me in this certain way. And Father, I'm committing to prepare by getting under other people and learning. I don't know what it is for you, but I want you to make this very personal. And I want us to take the next minute and a half and I want you to confess to God where you've been scared and where you're going to allow him to prepare you. Come on, all over this building. Let this be a moment with you and God. Lift it up in this place right now.